Well, it is a very tough time for institutionalists. Our first guest tonight is an institutionalist, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States of America, Eric Holder. The current Attorney General, Merrick Garland, is an institutionalist. If you asked either of those Justice Department institutionalists, say, 10 years ago, if they believe that a new attorney general serving a newly elected president should spend time investigating the previous president of another party or the actions of the Justice Department itself serving that previous president, they both would have said no. Yesterday, former Attorney General Eric Holder said, I am an institutionalist. My initial thought was not to indict the former president out of concern of how divisive it would be. But given what we have learned, I think he probably has to be held accountable. Given what we have learned, that changes everything for institutionalists these days. Institutionalists in the United States Senate who were opposed to changing the 60 vote rule in the Senate have changed their minds about that, given what we have learned. Mark Esper, the Secretary of Defense, during Donald Trump's last year in the presidency, is an institutionalist. When he was growing up, hoping to, hoping to be Secretary of Defense one day, he never dreamed he would ever reveal private conversations with the president who he served. But he changed his mind about doing that, given what he learned about Donald Trump. What specifically was he suggesting that the U.S. military should do to these protesters? There he says, can't you just shoot them? Just shoot them in the legs or something. And he's suggesting that that's what we should do, that we should bring in the troops and shoot the protesters. The commander in chief was suggesting that the U.S. military shoot protesters. Yes, in the straits American of our protesters. nation's capital. That's right. Shocking. We have seen in other countries a government use their military to shoot protesters. Right. What kind of governments are those? Well, those are banana republics, right? The phrase banana republic was coined in a 1904 novel describing the corrupt regime of a fictional tropical country. But 116 years later, to be pretending that corrupt dictatorial government that has no regard for the rule of law is a phenomenon known only to tropical countries capable of growing bananas is contemptible. For this part of the world, we should use the phrase Trump Republic. What Mark Esper was describing was a Trump Republic. The European version would be a Putin Republic. The tropical countries of this planet do not have nuclear weapons and do not pose a threat of firing missiles into neighboring countries or any other country. The president pulls me aside on at least a couple occasions and suggests that maybe we have the U.S. military shoot missiles into Mexico. Shoot missiles into Mexico for what? He would say to, to go after the cartels. And we would have this private discussion where I'd say, Mr. President, I, you know, I, I understand the motive. You politely push back on the idea. Did President Trump really say no one would know it was us? Yes. Yes, I, 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 he said that, and I, I just thought it was fanciful, right? Because, of course, it would be us. I was reluctant to tell this story because I think, I, I thought, people won't believe this. Unfortunately, that is a completely believable story in a Trump republic because Donald Trump is obviously, by a gigantic order of magnitude, the stupidest man who has ever won the Electoral College. And in the presidency, stupidity is dangerous. And thanks to the corruption of the Constitution, which has turned out to be a much weaker document than we thought, Mitch McConnell refused to follow the constitutional requirement of the Senate giving the President of the United States advice and consent on President Obama's last Supreme Court nominee. By refusing to even vote on President Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court, Mitch McConnell set up the stupidest president in history to appoint one-third of the Supreme Court using a list of possible nominees given to him by Mitch McConnell. That is corrupting the Constitution. And now that constitutionally corrupted Supreme Court is working on a draft opinion in which five Supreme Court justices, only one of whom 
was appointed by a Republican president who actually got the most votes in the presidential election, will, for the first time in the country's history, revoke a constitutional right. The constitutional right for women and girls and children who get pregnant to decide what happens next inside their own bodies. The Supreme Court is going to say it is not up to them. The Supreme Court is going to say it is entirely up to politicians. The Supreme Court is going to say that to every woman in America, to every teenage girl, to every 12-year-old child raped by her father or uncle or neighbor in Mississippi or Alabama or Texas or several other states, the Supreme Court is going to say to all of them, you must have the rapist's baby. You must see your rapist's eyes in your child for the rest of your life. A majority of Americans believes, believe that is barbaric. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who lied his way onto the Supreme Court by, among other things, claiming he never discussed or thought about Roe versus Wade, which was decided when he was in law school and everyone at every law school in America was talking about it, everyone except Clarence Thomas, if you believe his under oath testimony to the Senate. On Friday, that same Clarence Thomas gave a speech to a group of judges complaining that Americans are, quote, becoming addicted to wanting particular outcomes, not living with the outcomes we don't like. Clarence Thomas is now making it difficult to choose the most sickening things he and his wife have said since Donald Trump was defeated in his reelection campaign by Joe Biden. Clarence Thomas dared to say that to judges on Friday when all of those judges already knew that Clarence Thomas's wife was texting White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows repeatedly after Donald Trump lost the presidential election, urging Mark Meadows to do anything to overturn the result of the election. Clarence Thomas's wife never said that overturning the election had to be done legally. Every judge listening to Clarence Thomas give the most absurdist speech he's ever given in his life knew that Clarence Thomas's wife texted the White House chief of staff saying there are no rules in war when urging him to do everything possible to deny the voters of the United States of America the president they voted for. There are no rules in war is as clear a commitment to criminal conduct as you could ask for from the wife of a United States Supreme Court justice. Clarence Thomas's wife is addicted to wanting a particular outcome and not being willing to live with any other outcome. And she proved her addiction in her utterly deranged, constant texting to the last Trump White House chief of staff. It is the obliviousness of the United States Supreme Court that America is living under tonight, the utter obliviousness of the way people live. It is the utter obliviousness of the plight of the 12-year-old girl who is raped. And speaking to those judges on Friday, Clarence Thomas celebrated the dense obliviousness he and his Republican colleagues bring to work at the court every day. Clarence Thomas said the court, quote, can't be an institution that can be bullied into giving you just the outcomes you want. The events from earlier this week are a symptom of that. Leaking from the Supreme Court has continued over the weekend, as Rachel just mentioned, with more details reported in the Washington Post. A person close to the most conservative members of the court said Chief Justice Roberts told his fellow jurists in a private conference in early December that he planned to uphold the state law and write an opinion that left Roe and Casey in place for now. If true, that reporting is what the Chief Justice said in a room with only eight other people, all of whom were justices of the Supreme Court. Statements like that when only the Supreme Court justices are in the room, are often relayed to the justices' clerks so they can begin researching positions that each of the nine justices will take in their opinions. And so, all of the clerks working for all nine justice, justices would have known that information. But those justices are all free to discuss this with other people. There is nothing stopping Clarence Thomas, for example, from telling his wife at dinner what the Chief Justice said in conference today. And given what we have learned about Clarence Thomas's wife, we know there is nothing stopping her 
from saying anything to anyone because there are no rules in war.